Mm. All right. Do you want to start, or shall I say something? Okay. Yes, I can start. Okay. Then I say hello together. I don't know exactly who is on the Leipzig side. This the first hour today is a repetition of last week's meeting. Okay. Hi together. <laughs> Nice, I see you. Uh, normally, I would also be on site. I will be there and then uh, next week or uh, the week after next week, since we have Easter holidays next week. Um, this is a presence experience. That means we meet here to do this seminar. And in, I will just give a short recap what is planned. Today, there will be an introduction into the handling of Python. This lecture will be given by Michael, I guess. Yannick will assist with this. After my short introduction, Martin will also, Martin Potters will also say a few words. This seminar is a, a joint event between the University of Leipzig and Bauer's Universität Weimar. And it's really great that we do this. We want to get at a rather high level here. This is an advanced seminar. We want to do deep learning technologies for language processing. And today, it's again, I told it already, a Python session. For the Weimar people, the seminar, we have, um, we think about 12 to 16 talks. They should be about half an hour. And they will be given from you and they will also be streamed to the Leipzig people. We will do this in the third part of the semester. So the last uh, four or five weeks so that also others can learn from the talks and the content that you have uh, prepared for them. Okay, from my side, this is for today enough. We expect active participation. This is different to um, a reading. And this means that you also should be there and probably ask questions, prepare material that we give to you and listen to the other talks. Okay, that's uh, from my side. Martin, if it is okay for you, I would like to hand over to you. Yes, thank you. Just uh, let me quickly share my screen. Just a second. Uh, where is it? Firefox scan. Oh dear. Um, it takes another short second. I have to let the app share. Now it should work. You should see a window. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Um, my name is Martin Potterst. I'm a junior professor at Leipzig University. And we are very happy that this seminar is not a one university event, but a two university event where the universities of Leipzig and the University of Weimar, Bauhaus University of Weimar, are working together in order to basically bring, bring to you the best that both of us can offer. And this is not uh, by accident that we, do the, that we do this together. Many of you who browse our web pages, meanwhile, might have noticed that we are a joint group uh, under the Webis group. Webis is also the Weimar group, is the original name. Uh, but, but meanwhile, we have spread out to five universities already. And um, under this catchphrase here, information is nothing without retrieval. We started um, more or less on information retrieval research, but meanwhile also branching out into natural language processing, computational linguistics, machine learning, and uh, Benno's uh, special background, also symbolic AI. We're doing uh, lots of research in these directions together and individually. And if you want to have a look at who we are uh, on the people page at babies.de, um, you will see all of us. Uh, meanwhile, at, as I said, five universities, Froning, Halle, Wittenberg, 
Leipzig and Paderborn as well. And we organize also our teaching material together, as you see here on the lecture notes page. All of these different lectures are given in different versions uh, or also the same version based on the same material that we uh, jointly develop um, uh, at different places. And uh, this year uh, for the seminar in particular, we want to um, join forces together, uh, not just teaching wise, but perhaps also in a way that will allow you to um, take advantage of the fact that uh, there are people in both places. The lecture slides uh, for the seminar, there will be a lecture accompanying the seminar uh, will also appear here uh, uh, with links appearing in your respective uh, seminar web pages or Moodle pages that you use. Our research in the Vivis group uh, pertains, as I said, to information retrieval, natural language processing, data mining, machine learning, and we're also developing a number of tools some selected challenges include synthesis of text, how to generate high quality summaries, for example, for a given web page, uh, or um, a big branch of our work pertains to computational ar argumentation. How can we understand? How can machines argue? And how can we analyze the arguments of other people and get it from their texts? Authorship analysis looks at style rather than um, content and uh, we also try to develop new technology that goes into the direction of computational ethics and for example analyzing the credibility of certain sources on the web or whether they try to deceive you. All of this uh, might be topics that also are also relevant to um, uh, the seminar and especially also since there's a lot of machine learning and AI in, inside of them and so the topics uh, that will be presented later for you to select among uh, uh, may come from these or similar uh, problem domains. Perhaps another exciting thing that we are doing together and that also is the foundation of this seminar uh, are our facilities, especially the cluster computers that we um, have acquired and operate together. Most of them are running at uh, Weimar uh, in the digital Bauhaus lab, um, but meanwhile also in other places uh, computing has been uh, installed and uh, we are also giving uh, students from both places access to these clusters. Perhaps the most relevant ones for you will be three of them, the beta web cluster, which is a 130 node machine here um, with uh, more than 1,600 cores and uh, 25 terabytes of RAM, four petabytes of hard disk space. And on these machines, we do lots of parallel data processing. Um, if you've heard of the Hadoop tool or Spark before, these are the um, uh, these are these are the um, uh, cluster computing frameworks running on this. And the Gamma Web Cluster is um, a specialized cluster for graphics cards and therefore also for machine learning. It includes 24 NVIDIA A100s, which was until very recently the top of the line of NVIDIA's. And uh, these graphics cards will serve you to also experiment and train your own machine learning models. On the Delta Web Cluster, we host lots of web data, 12 petabytes total. This is uh, why this cluster uh, uh, is separate from the Beta Web Cluster. It's what uh, is usually called a data lake. It serves data to the other processing clusters. And uh, the biggest data set that is yet hosted there is um, obtained from the Internet Archive. Um, the Internet Archive in San Francisco, you may have heard of it, archive.org, the Wayback Machine, uh, which is able to browse old web pages. We have a license for their data and a joint collaboration with them, which allows us to download data at the, uh, or on the order of petabytes from them that uh, will allow us to do um, or to uh, harvest lots of ground truth for interesting problems. And this may also be one of the topics that can be uh, part of this seminar. So this concludes my short brief introduction very related to the seminar of the Vivis group. And uh, I will now hand over 
to Michael, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Let me quickly switch to my screen share. No. Uh, this is what I want. So if you have any okay. questions, just ask and we can answer them. Mm, yeah, yeah exactly. Yannick, good that you, you say this. Um, just a short intro interruption for me. Benno is here. Um, how many students are now online, uh, on site? Uh, five, still I, five. I can go back to the other room to see if there are more, but... Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, we will, we will send out a mail and explain this again, and probably some of the um, post list which are waiting uh, might join the seminar then if the others are not interested anymore in an online um, yeah at online course okay yeah then i will proceed um since uh, yeah a lot of new people joined since last week i will basically repeat what i already said then um, I will also briefly review the um, tutorial we had last week and then um, today at 3.30, uh, Lukas and Niklas from Leipzig will continue with the second part of this tutorial. But uh, this would also be a good opportunity to ask any questions or, you know, of course, for those who haven't uh, heard this bit yet. Um, so I want to start today with um, an introduction into how this course is organized. We um, refined a little bit how we are going to handle this on the Weimar side, so there is also some new information in that regard. And then I will give a brief introduction into the field of language technologies in general that we are dealing with here. And um, yeah, like I said, finally, I will review our um, first Python tutorial. So the, the goals that we pursue with this course is um, essentially we, we hope for you to um, gain both a, a, well, a theoretical overview into how um, modern language technologies work and some hands-on practical experience at the same time. And uh, we will focus mainly on, um, well, uh, sequence processing uh, models based on transformer technologies that have been developed in the past few years, but we will also look into some of the um, historical predecessors of those as well. And uh, yeah, in the process, um, since it's a seminar, you will also have the chance to get some practice in scientific work in well, tackling a small real world ish research problem in the uh, language technology area and to practicing uh, writing and presenting uh, scientific work in the process. And yeah, of course, always uh, also get some hands-on experience with uh, the tools that you need to do this. So the course has um, several components. We have, um, although it is a seminar, we, we do plan some uh, lecture sessions, um, such as uh, this one here is a bit less interactive than uh, would be typical of a seminar. We will have some of these to cover the theoretical aspects of the material in the coming weeks as well, but um, probably not throughout the entire semester. You will so know this, what to expect. This, this week is a bit weird because we're mostly doing the remote. Oh, you're sitting here, but uh, starting next week, we will do this more interactively. Starting in two weeks because next week is a holiday. Right, next but, week, yeah. Yeah. Next time. <laughs> right. Um, okay, yeah, the, the other um, thing is, um, this will also be mainly um, relevant for the, for the first half or so of the semester, uh, we are running a series of lab sessions where we want to um, bring you up to speed in terms of your implementation skills. So we will uh, present some uh, important frameworks for doing deep learning with Python and with a focus on um, language processing problems, we will um, yeah, explore how to, how, how to get started with these. Starting with Keras, we will look into the uh, Hugging Face ecosystem a little bit later on. And um, once we get to know that, then we are 
basically at the level of uh, modern uh, large language models and um, that will be the the kind of the, ne the next step of the seminar will be a, a sort of mini project where you will um, explore the um, capabilities of large language models um, by then you will have gotten to know a bit how these models work and uh, what they can do it's, essentially they do a very simple thing which is uh, given some text predict the next word but they do this quite well and they can consider nowadays quite a large amount of uh, text as context and um, previous research has found that these models have some interesting um, uh, capabilities that um, somehow emerge from predicting the next, the next word in a bit in a bit of text and um, basically you can get this model uh, get these models to um, solve some tasks without needing to do any additional training uh, beyond the text prediction task and uh, this is then um, essentially an instance of zero shot learning and um, you entice these models to solve these tasks by um, basically crafting a particular bit of of input text and this is then called prompt engineering this uh, getting the input text to look the way it needs to look to solve this particular problem so that's uh, one thing we will look at um, as a kind of short mini project and then from as of our current plan uh, starting in about the ninth week of the semester you will uh, get a topic for a larger group project that you will work on until the end of the semester and that then most of the remaining uh, deliverables in the seminar will be related to. And um, these include, um, yeah, like uh, Professor Stein already said, you will be expected to actively participate in the seminar. And that also means being at least uh, as often as possible uh, present in the in the seminar room if you have in a good excuse one or two times that is of course okay as usual but it is a presence um, event for the most part so you should be there and uh, be available for discussions with your fellow students you will need to do some implementation work for the course project um, then we will ask you to submit a uh, kind of an expose and work plan once you have um, received the topic for your final project to um, yeah, make sure everyone is on the same page as to what the project is about and what the goals are. Um, then somewhat later, we will hold a series of midterm presentations where you will have about 30 minutes to talk about your topic and the state of the work so far, what you have found and any open problems and finally at the end of the semester we will have a final report per group where um, yeah the outcomes and uh, results of the projects should be discussed and this then should be in a like proper scientific format with references so to go into a bit more detail on what these course projects will be about um, they will take up about half of the semester and you will do them in groups of two people. The main focus will be in, on practically realizing a um, somewhat more complex research problem in the area of language technologies. Some of the ideas on topics we have um, discussed so far, you can also find on the slide. So we were thinking of uh, having to work on large scale web data analytics pipelines or on uh, website classification and template induction uh, models. We have um, several topics in the direction of large language models, for example, uh, benchmarking them for um, their uh, inference performance or um, using them in a constrained generation setup or uh, fine tuning them for specific language generation tasks. We were thinking of um, working in the area of analyzing language usage, for example, in large web data sets. We have uh, some ideas in the direction of detecting text reuse. So that is when one bit of text is copied or rephrased and reused somewhere else. 
or uh, we were thinking in the direction of uh, retrieving source code or using um, language models to detect malware even. And uh, beyond that, we are also open to proposals of own ideas from your side. This is also part of the reason why we have moved back the uh, start of these projects a little bit. So once you get a bit into the topic, you have a chance to, uh, if you come up with some idea that particularly interests you in this area, then uh, we can definitely discuss uh, making that a focus of the seminar project as well. We do expect some um, things that you that you already know for the purpose of the seminar. For one thing, um, you should either, either already have good Python skills or be an expert in another language and be willing to teach yourself. If you, yeah, if you have uh, really good prog programming expertise already in some uh, other programming language, then uh, this should be possible, but it is of course some extra work. We expect you have um, prior exposure to um, machine learning basics. So that's why um, since also there was a lot of demand for participation, we so far mainly um, admitted people who have already passed our um, introduction to machine learning course with a, uh, with a good grade. So um, yeah, we will need to use some uh, Linux command line tools to get our work done and it would definitely help to have some uh, prior exposure to, to those things. Um, yeah, using tools like SSH uh, for working on remote machines, working with Git on the command line or using Tmux or Screen for instance to um, yeah, have persistent SSH sessions, for example. And of course you uh, yeah, probably have some general computer science background and that will also be useful in a lot of ways here. So for any um, aspects of these prerequisites where you're not so sure yet, we have some literature suggestions here as well. Um, for example, the, um, the book Deep Learning by Goodfellow, Benjo and Koval has a, a couple of chapters on um, mathematical foundations that are quite useful. Just as well, um, you could have a look at our own machine learning lecture that you probably have already taken, but if not, uh, the slides by themselves are good for a catch up. Um, yeah, the, uh, all of these books listed here are available online, by the way. So this was kind of the, the focus for choosing them, but there are a lot of other good books out there as well. Um, yeah, this bit Martin already discussed to some extent. So um, we will use a large amount of hardware probably to tackle some of the problems that we have to tackle in the course of this seminar. And for that, we will use the computing clusters at our site. This um, picture here, once again, compares them with respect to their, their hardware loadout, the number of nodes in the first row here, the amount of disk, the amount of cores and uh, memory. So the, the beta web cluster we use for dataset processing. I'm going to skip through this a bit since we covered this already. We have a cluster called Gamma Web that has a bunch of high-end uh, GPUs that will be useful for yeah, training deep learning models. And we have our data lake that has a lot of disk. So that would um, conclude the, the first bit of this introduction. Next, I will go a bit more into the topic of language technologies that we are going to be working with. But uh, first, um, let's see if there are any questions that anyone would like to ask. Any and questions? None, okay. <laughs> no questions? No questions, it seems. Okay. Um, one second. Yeah, then. Okay, I'll just... Uh, um, Janik, uh, this is yeah. Benno here again. A few of are in front of the people at the moment. Uh, can you ask um, whether those uh, students who are sitting there have already heard machine learning? Have you heard machine learning? <laughs> uh, all except one? Yeah. 
all except one. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, we are, we are working in the general area of language technologies here. And in particular, we want to um, yeah, get to a, a state where we can teach computers uh, human language as well as a, as a human and perhaps better. And um, this slide kind of summarizes a, I would say, progression of goals in this direction. This is uh, also part of our um, uh, NLP course, if you've heard that, you might have seen the slide before. So from... Um, Michael, I don't so, see the slides. Yeah. Oh, then, okay, one second, then I need to... Yeah, thanks for the hint. This would have been odd. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll have this fixed in a second. Convince Zoom to play nice. So, is this visible now? Yes. Very good. Okay, good, perfect. So, this is the slide I was just talking about. <laughs> um, right. So, so from uh, simply supporting humans in writing, we basically want to uh, make computers more and more intelligent about language up to the level where they can kind of hold a natural discussion and understand like obscure aspects like humor, for example. I have here a very um, brief and um, quite incomplete history of some um, milestones in language technologies, just to showcase that um, computer scientists have um, been thinking about this problem for a quite long time, beginning with a proposal by Shannon and Weaver in 1949 to um, use computers for translation. The translation systems that people came up with in that era were extremely simple by today's standards, but were still quite a milestone. So this was basically a, a dictionary looked up with not even a very large dictionary. But nevertheless, um, this um, yeah, kind of made it clear that uh, computers would be uh, yeah, gaining language capabilities over the, uh, over the coming decades. Um, Alan Turing came up with this idea of the Turing test where basically a, um, let's say an agent under evaluation would uh, communicate with a, a person through a text only interface and the person would have to decide whether this agent is a human or a computer. So that is the, the Turing test. And um, a language technology can be said to pass the Turing test if it uh, successfully convinces their counterpart that it is human even when it is not. And um, yeah, based on this, uh, this idea, this is essentially the, the, the foundation for chatbot systems. Uh, Joseph Weizenbaum came up with an early um, and again by today's standards very simple chatbot in the form of Eliza, which um, is kind of a simulated uh, progerian psychologist. So Eliza simply uh, rephrases and uh, repeats everything you tell her, but um, passed the Turing test nevertheless in many cases. I suppose this was intended more of a demonstration that. Um, that uh, people tend to trust computers too easily. But um, in that sense, it, it succeeded. And um, yeah, it kind of um, forms the, the beginning of a trajectory towards uh, more and more capable chatbots as we have today. Um, yeah, the uh, decades of the 70s and 80s were dominated by um, symbolic approaches to AI, which um, even though they nowadays are probably not as hot of a research area, currently they still are an important part in the most complex AI systems uh, next to the um, statistical components that uh, kind of had their 
the yeah, first major epoch in the 1990s. The, um, yeah, we, we saw the first beginnings of neural language models that we use them today in the 2000s. Um, two IBM projects that I want to highlight here are um, IBM Watson, which um, is a system that, um, well, it is essentially a, a question answering system that they successfully taught to uh, play Je Jeopardy, this, uh, this um, game show where um, you are given a statement and you have to find the correct question to which the given statement is the answer. So this um, requires quite a high level of language understanding and uh, they started working on this in 2006 and in I think 2011 it was basically good enough to to participate in this um, in this Jeopardy game. And a kind of follow-up project called Project Debater was started in 2011 and um, this um, is a system that can participate in argumentative debates. So this, uh, this means it can understand spoken language, extract the main uh, claims and uh, arguments, and then formulate a response and do this over several rounds and participate in, yeah, in debate competitions, basically. And this, again, took seven years to get to that level. Here I have... Um, basically the, the past decade in um, kind of uh, key technical developments. Um, in the 2010s, uh, we had some important components that, um, uh, that include the idea of word embeddings, while um, yeah, distributed representations of words have been around for a while. Um, the work by Mikulov and also the, uh, Pennington was um, transformative in the sense that they uh, came up with a with a good approximation of, of uh, learning these embeddings, and this um, was state of the art for a good bit. It's not used as much anymore today, since these um, are essentially context-free word embeddings. So they, for the same token, they always yield the same embedding. And nowadays, uh, context-dependent embeddings are more popular. Um, another interesting development in the 2010s was that um, neural network architectures, even when they had been developed like several decades previously, um, became suddenly interesting for NLP applications, which was mainly because uh, computing got cheap enough. Um, yeah, I'll get to that again in a little bit. Um, we also saw then in that context, the development of sequence to sequence neural networks, uh, which we will cover in some detail some uh, weeks down the line. Um, the attention mechanism was first developed in 2015 by Badano and his colleagues. And this again then formed the basis for the, uh, for the transformer model from 2017, which is uh, kind of the closest common ancestor of all of the uh, state-of-the-art neural language models that we have today. And um, where basically the um, recurrence operation in um, sequence processing networks was removed entirely and replaced by attention and self-attention, which led to a great um, efficiency increase where uh, the entire sequence could be processed in parallel instead of sequentially. Then, yeah, in 2018, um, the key idea was uh, essentially taking these transformer architectures and pre-training them on a large amount of text. So we had Elmo, BERT, and GPT, for, for instance, which um, differ mainly in their, their training objective. So, so BERT is a mass language model where you give it some uh, unlabeled sentences, let's say from a large collection of text, and then you obscure one or several words somewhere in the middle of the sentence and um, ask the model to, to predict the missing word. So this means without human annotation, you can generate a lot of uh, training data for 
GPT. This is a an auto regressive language model. The training task is even simpler. They uh, basically give some uh, prefix of uh, of a sentence, let's say, and predict the next word. And then you can do this for all prefixes, of course. Um, yeah, by 2020, these um, types of language models had grown in their size enough that it turned out that they can solve quite a few uh, tasks beyond the uh, language modeling that they are trained to do. Uh, GPT-3, for instance, has been in the video quite a bit because uh, of its capability to generate uh, human level text, at least in some domains and at least um, with some cherry picking, let's say. And uh, after that, we have seen larger uh, language models than that even, even though they are not really accessible to anyone not working for Google. An interesting example is the um, work by the Eleutha AI group. They published, for example, GPT Neo X in 2022, which you can actually download and run on your own uh, hardware. Even it's uh, like uh, a bit less than 10% of the size of GPT-3, but fully available. So as I mentioned, the cost of computing, um, I wanted to highlight this again as this is a, a kind of a key factor for why um, modern language technologies are possible at all. So in this graph, um, this is basically, this is done by the AI impacts group using uh, data from Wikipedia. So maybe not extremely reliable, but the general trend is definitely reliable. So you see on the y-axis, the cost of one gigaflop worth of computation. A gigaflop is a billion floating point operation uh, per second. So that um, yeah is a measure, a, a somewhat crude, but uh, easy to understand measure of um, how fast the CPU is or a processor in general. To put this into context, um, most uh, current smartphones have uh, graphics processing uh, chips on board that can do several hundreds of gigaflops. So this is um, the price in US dollars adjusted for inflation to 2013 for a single gigaflop of computation on the on the y-axis. So this means, uh, ah, sorry, this is the base 10 logarithm of the of the price. So this means in 1960 this was. Uh, something 10 to the 14, so uh, trillions of dollars for a fraction of the compute of a, of a smartphone. And uh, we crossed into the area of uh, less than $1 for this uh, somewhere in the early 2010s. And um, this um, yeah, seems to have been the, the threshold that was critical for making these uh, neural language technologies widely applicable. In, yeah, I also already mentioned this, that of course, in tandem with that, the uh, size of the models that people were able to train has also increased on a kind of log linear scale. So on this graph, instead, we have on the y-axis, the number of parameters. So that means um, essentially the number of weights that uh, a model can learn. And um, yeah, the, the yeah the um, in 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 the last three years, this number has increased by uh, about a factor of ten per year. This uh, trend, according to latest research, is probably not quite as log linear anymore. If you've heard about the uh, Chinchilla model that was published uh, in the last few weeks, I think. This, so if we say this is 2022, this is actually a bit smaller than GPT-3. Like, uh, I think it has a under 100 billion parameters, but uh, it outperforms it nevertheless. So this is, this implies, um, yeah, not quite as clear as the scaling law as we thought, but um, uh, yeah, this is ongoing research. Also then this pertains to this plot where, um, before this latest development, um, uh, it was apparent that the, the performance of the model, which here on the y-axis is expressed in terms of the test loss, um, falls 
both with the logarithm of the um, amount of computation invested in training the model with the uh, size of the data set used to train the model and uh, with the number of parameters. This is still true um, according to the latest developments, but um, it turns out that the, the data requirements are higher than was thought in 2020. But so just to say there, there is definitely a scaling law that makes models more powerful as computation data and parameters increase, but researchers don't completely agree yet what it looks like. Uh, I want to give one concrete example regarding the compute and data requirements for a sort of state-of-the-art language model using this uh, open source GPT Neo X 20 v that I mentioned a little while back. Um, this needed to be trained for two and a half months on 96 NVIDIA A100 GPUs. In our own cluster, we have 24 of these GPUs, so about a fifth of this. So it would take us correspondingly at least five times as long, if not longer, because they also have quite a lot faster network than we do. But um, we are in the same order of magnitude, at least, of being able to train something like this. Um, the training data that they used was a also an open source data set curated specifically for this purpose. This um, comprises 825 gigabytes worth of text collected from various sources on the internet. So it's about um, a third of it is academic text collected from archive and PubMed and so on. About another third is general internet text. This includes a, um, a CC is common crawl, so a, a general web crawl, open web text too is also based on general web crawls. And then they have uh, Wikipedia and Stack Exchange data in there. And um, then a few other miscellaneous sources, for example, um, this is Project Gutenberg, so uh, books that are no longer in copyright. Uh, this is another book corpus with uh, prose text. Um, so, in summary, this uh, the the mere act of creating this data set required a large um, data processing effort, and um, this kind of takes us to the big data technology aspect of this uh, of the seminar, where we also kind of want to think about what you have to do to to collect data like this, and um, in previous uh, similar uh, seminars from, from past years, we spent uh, a lot of time thinking about what the, the architecture for a system like this looks like. And this, this big data stack that we have here kind of roughly summarizes this, where we start at the, at the lowest level with a uh, data acquisition layer that ingests data in various formats. Of course, when we are collecting web data, then crawling is probably the most important uh, act of data collection here. Then we kind of store this in a unstructured, um, but necessarily distributed file system given the size of the data. So in our case, our um, data web cluster and Ceph file system fills this um, storage layer role. And um, once we have the data ingested, we can start uh, modeling and structuring it and then um, extracting uh, relevant information. So for a um, collecting a uh, language data set, you would here probably do a lot of filtering of removing um, data that is, uh, for example, not in the set of target languages that you want. So th let's say we want to limit ourselves to English, for example, which we might or might not want to do depending on the specific uh, goals of the operation. Uh, we would definitely want to exclude um, somehow low quality data or data in modalities that we're not interested in, like um, images or binary, if that is not what we are looking at. And the um, neural language models then ultimately live in the highest uh, data consumption layer of the stack where they benefit from all this uh, collection and filtering. The um, yeah, final question I want to briefly touch on is what concrete um, technologies you would employ for, for tasks like this. This um, yeah, 
kind of overwhelming figure here is from from Matt Turk. He's a, a venture venture capitalist in the um, yeah data science and AI area, and uh, his um, firm every year puts out a map like this of the entire um, big data ecosystem. They recently have started calling this the machine learning AI and data landscape because that is uh, abbreviated with MAT, which is kind of fitting given the, the sheer number of, of projects that exist in this space. And uh, I guess the main purpose of this is to uh, yeah, kind of show how much is going on in this area at the moment. At the moment. And it's clear that it's not uh, nearly possible to, to know what each of these things is about for a single human. And that uh, is also not something we will be able to accomplish here, really. I do want to focus a little bit into the um, open source projects that are mentioned here. Even those are far too many to uh, to know for a single human. Wait a minute. Question? Is that yeah, a question? Just a short question about the, the stack you showed between one slide to four. This one? Why um, is the structured storage that important? Or is it um, is it also structured data or is it just uh, structured storage? Or uh, like a dependency, is, is structured data the dependency for the whole stack? Um, uh, you, you mean layer in the yeah, layer? Yeah, the, the middle layer, data management mm -hmm. layer. So um, the amount of structure that you need, of course, varies a lot by the, the problem that you're working on. In this, in a text collection task such as this, it can be quite simple, but uh, I think it's still clear that you do need some structure. So I mentioned the, the language, for example, that you would probably want to differentiate by. And um, here um, you have all these, these sub data sets that this, um, this pile text data set is composed of. So you would certainly have somehow an annotation that uh, tracks which sub data set this is from. Um, one reason this is important is that, uh, for example, in training this uh, GPT-NEO model, they uh, weighted the sub data sets differently. For example, there's an expectation that uh, the quality of the text in Wikipedia is higher, let's say, than, than general uh, web crawl text. So they would um, essentially present the Wikipedia data to the model for more training iterations than the, the common crawl data to um, yeah, give, give the give the higher quality uh, writing a bit more weight in training, and that's um, one thing you could accomplish by let's say storing this in a in a columnar format where you have a uh, column for which um, data source this originally was from. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. So that was yes. There are no further questions. I guess no further questions. Okay. Okay. Um, right. Okay. I wanted to zoom into this a bit. This is still uh, more than we will need in the seminar, but there are some technologies listed here that we will actually come into contact. We will today um, have a quick uh, beginning look into, into Keras, which is a framework for machine learning. We um, will later look at the uh, Hugging, uh, Hugging Face Transformers library. We will see the OpenAI Open AI API, which uh, is also somehow a bit wrongly positioned in the open source uh, row here because it's not really, but never mind that. Um, we do use Kubernetes a lot in our infrastructure, so you will very likely interact with the Kubernetes cluster, even if you might not directly notice unless uh, what uh, you are doing for your project requires that that level of complexity but a lot of the services that we use to access our data and infrastructure run on kubernetes and martin mentioned spark we do use spark a lot for um, data pre-processing tasks so this is also likely something that you might come into contact with um, okay yeah that also concludes this bit for today I guess we could uh, see if there are questions again. Any more? No, doesn't seem like there are questions. Okay. <laughs>